morning. It is great to see you this morning. I just, I'm, I'm just looking around because yesterday in uh, our men's meeting, uh, it was said during the men's meeting that the guys are going to do something different that may put everybody else out of your comfort zone. Where they usually sit, they decided we're going to sit someplace different and see what happens. We're going to visit some new people, and so I'm looking to see where they're at. And I told them, I said, you're really going to throw off the attendance because I know where everybody sits. And now I'm going to have to learn it all over again. But it is great to see you this morning. So glad that you are here in God's house, and we've got a special day planned. Baptism, and God's got some words for us, and hopefully is going to speak to all of our hearts this morning. But before we do anything else, why don't you go ahead and stand up. And I want you to find somebody new that you have not said hi to and welcome them into the house of the Lord this morning. Welcome to Sunlight Today. Yeah. 
marvelous day. Amen? Amen. Uh, if you're reading through the Bible with us this year, we find ourselves this week in Lamentations. And if you think, uh, you know, the book of Jeremiah is rough, you get into Lamentations. And yeah, but uh, there's this moment where everything changes in uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and following, where we find these words, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We praise God for his word this morning to us and for this reminder Wherever we're at, wherever we find ourselves this morning, whatever season in life, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're going through, He is there. He is faithful. He's good. We, we need only be still and wait on Him. So as we remember these things, as we prepare for a time of prayer here in just a moment, I uh, want to ask for prayer for some individuals from our church family this day and this week ahead. Uh, please continue to be in prayer for Joyce Gerber's dad, Roger. Uh, as he battles some, some health issues. Keep Roger in your prayers for God's healing touch and God's strength over him in these days. Um, also, uh, please be in prayer for Brittany Satterfield. Brittany is uh, back in the hospital this weekend, battling an infection. Uh, as many of you know, she had surgery recently. So keep her in your prayers for God's uh, healing touch over her in these days as well. So as the altars are open, uh, maybe you've got a prayer request, maybe you've got a petition, maybe you've got something that's heavy on your heart this morning. Uh, now's the time as the worship team leads us that we encourage you to come to the altars there's individuals here that would love to spend time praying with you this morning so the altars are open let's worship him together
Would you join us in a time of prayer this morning? Father God, we, we thank you. We thank you that we can come before you this morning here in your house. God, wherever we're at, wherever we find ourselves this morning, and God, as you move in this place, God, uh, you know, you know the needs. God, there's those here this morning that need encouragement. God, there's those here this morning that are, that are far from you that, uh, God, need to enter into right relationship with you. God, there's those here this morning that, uh, God, have wandered from you and that need to come back. God, whatever the case might be, God, you know, and, and meet us right where we're at this morning. God, for those that need a physical touch, God, we pray for healing. God, we think of Roger, we think of Brittany, we think of others, God, that uh, we just pray your, your touch and your protection. God, there's those here this morning that are celebrating, God, whether it's uh, new life or, God, just your provision or, God, the healing work that you've done. God, we just thank you for uh, all the blessings that you give us. And, God, we pray, God, that, uh, again, wherever we find ourselves, God, that we would just be faithful in the ways that you've called us to be faithful in this season. God, so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what we trust we're gonna, you're going to continue to do. So God, continue to move in this place. Have your way. We pray all these things in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and our coming King. We pray all these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm sure you got a bulletin when you came in this morning. I'm going to go ahead and encourage you to take that out now and go ahead and tear off that back flap. That allows you to mark your attendance here with us this morning. Also allows us to partner with you, to connect with you in prayer. Uh, we've got a whole team of folks that pray over these requests each and every week. Uh, so take some time and do that. And then you can just leave it in the pew when you exit the sanctuary this morning. Um, or you can deposit it in one of the baskets in the back next to each one of the exit doors. Um, however you choose to do that. But I want to encourage you to take some time and do that this morning. Uh, if you're worshiping here with us this morning for the very first time, we're so very glad you're here. Uh, here at Sunlight Wesleyan Church, we're about loving people to Jesus. It's why we exist, and uh, day in and day out, week in and week out, uh, we're here. So we're glad. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, plenty of information in the bulletin about events, activities, things coming up in the life of the church in the days ahead. Uh, the teens have their big kickoff event tonight, uh, so that'll be an exciting time. Wednesday night uh, activities have, there we go, Rick's excited about it, so it's something. Uh, Wednesday night activities have kicked off, so uh, kids and, and uh, adult uh, programming uh, this Wednesday and Wednesdays that follow, and uh, yeah, lots of neat things going on. Grandparents' Day in two weeks uh, on Sunday, September 10th, so I encourage you to uh, be here, be a part of that. Plenty of things going on in the life of the church. We wouldn't be able to do all these things uh, without your faithful and generous support. So this is the time in the service that we uh, would traditionally collect the tithes and offerings. We don't pass the plate anymore, but we do have uh, boxes set up in the back next to each one of the exit doors. Um, so whether it's during this next worship song uh, or at the conclusion of the service, we encourage you to deposit your tithes and offerings in those boxes. Uh, many of you take advantage of the uh, electronic, of the automatic giving option, and, and for that we're very grateful uh, because as a church we wouldn't be able to do all these things that we do without your faithful and generous support. So let me pray now over the tithes and offerings before we go any further this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your provision and for your faithfulness to us. God, displayed in so many ways. And uh, God, we pray now, God, uh, that you would uh, bless both the gift and the giver this morning. God, uh, as we seek to be, uh, God, good stewards of all that you blessed us with in this life. God, uh, our time, our talents, our, our resources, and God, uh, the financial resources that you blessed us with are no different. God, it's, it's, it's all yours. Uh, it's just uh, on loan to us from you. So, God, we pray, God, your blessing this morning, God, over that collection. And God, we pray, God, just your continued blessing over us as a, as a church and as we seek to be the light in this community that you called us to be. We pray these things this morning in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Our names are Pearson and Rosa Harnish, and we partnered with FCW's ICU sponsorship program. We thought it was super awesome and kind of a humbling experience, just because typically you would think it's your money, you choose who it goes to, you choose your child or whatever, but this was a cool opportunity that that child had the opportunity to look at all the pictures on the wall and they saw ours and it was just really cool for whatever reason they Shamir our sponsor child pulled our picture down and showed us so it was just humbling to see that and every time I watch it I almost cry I don't really know why it's just we never met this kid and we never would have known about him but he saw our picture and just pulled it right down and so it's just cool that he got to choose us. We read his background you know, when you see, you know, a mom abandoned him, two years old, his dad drowned, and he's living with a step-grandfather with four other children. Like, that's a tough life. And just to see a smile on his face when he's, you know, he can't, the language barrier is there, but just the smile speaks a thousand words. You don't need words in that situation. You just need a smile. And you can just tell, you know, we're both emotional, she's crying, it's, it's great emotions, but you know, seeing his smile is what really, is why, is why we're trying to help out. Good morning again. Don't worry, the big guy's back. I'm not preaching this morning. Uh, but uh, no, I do have the opportunity to give an announcement. Um, as many of you know, uh, I have the great privilege of um, leading our uh, missions uh, support committee here at, here at Sunlight. And uh, we have an opportunity. Uh, Forgotten Children is one of the organizations that we sponsor uh, as a church, a local organization that does incredible good uh, in several countries around the world. Um, I actually have an opportunity in November, I'm gonna be going uh, to Uganda uh, with a small team from Forgotten Children. And we're gonna be doing this thing that you just saw in the video right behind you. So there's gonna be um, opportunities in the next few weeks. We're gonna have some signups here. Uh, if, if you as, a, as an individual or as a couple or as a family or maybe as a Sunday school class, if you would be interested in being a part of the uh, kind of reverse uh, child sponsorship uh, that Forgotten Children is doing, um, we're going to do one of those while we're, while we're over there. So we're going to be taking uh, pictures from, you know, supporters here uh, in, uh, locally, you know, at Sunlight and other churches and other places. We're going to bring them over there, and kiddos are going to be selecting uh, families uh, that are going to be sponsoring sponsoring them. So it's a really neat opportunity. It's a really neat twist on uh, something that uh, you know maybe some of us are already a part of. Uh, but uh, if you're if you're at all interested in that, I would feel feel free to see me after church today. Uh, like I said, we're going to have some signups the next few weeks. I believe the online signup is is already active, so you can do that online. But feel free to see me um, after church. Happy to get you connected with that. Um, it's going to be a really neat opportunity. Uh, again, one more way that we. Uh, you know, can be uh, partnering with, supporting uh, a really neat ministry that's doing a whole lot of really good work uh, around the world. So uh, feel free to see me afterwards if you're at all interested in that. And thank you, as always, as, as a church, for your faithful and generous support. The uh, Missions uh, Fundraising Committee oversees um, over $30,000 that are donated every year uh, from you as a church above and beyond your normal collection of tithes and offerings. And uh, we get to uh, share those resources with organizations like Forgotten Children, with missionaries in a variety of countries around the world, with local organizations that are doing good work here in Wells County. Uh, so it's a really neat way to be able to give back. So thank you. Thank you for your support. And without further ado, I didn't clear this with him earlier, so I'm actually not sure where he's going to be coming from. But please give a warm welcome for my good friend and yours, Pastor Lyle Breeding. Thank you, thank you. God is good. And all the time. Amen, amen, amen. It is amazing, uh, absolutely amazing to be back with you this morning, to be able to sit here. To be able to open God's word for us, 
I've enjoyed the last four weeks where I've heard Pastor Lane, Carl, and Pastor John as they have shared what God has placed on their hearts, and they did a marvelous job. Would you give them a great hand for what they have done? Yes. But I also realized in that four weeks how much I missed being with you, how much I missed God's call on my life where he says, preach the word, and I was not able to do that from recovery. So it is amazing to be with you this morning. It is amazing to be able to open God's word for you. So, so as happy as I am to be with you this morning, it's time to get to the preaching of, that God, of God's word that he has called me to do. So towards the end of the 19th century, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the local paper. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. That was his obituary. That was his eulogy. But actually, it was Alfred's older brother who had died. A newspaper reporter had made a mistake. But the account was so profound, it had such a profound effect on Nobel that he decided he wanted to be known for something other than developing the means to kill people efficiently and for amassing a fortune in the process. So he initiated the Nobel Prize, the award for scientists and writers who foster peace. Nobel said every man ought to have the chance to correct his eulogy in midstream and write a new one. I'm going to change that a little bit and say that every person ought to have the chance to correct their eulogy midstream and write a new one. Which means that every one of us who are here today, everyone who is watching us today or maybe watch this later on, has an opportunity to change where you're at now to something else. But we have to ask ourselves, what would our eulogy be? What would, what would people say about us? Every one of us is going to die someday, that is, unless the Lord comes back first. But before we die, we need to ask ourselves this question. Are there any areas in my life, any areas in my life that I need to change before I stand before God on Judgment Day? If your obituary appeared in the paper today, what would it say? What would your eulogy be? And while some might think this idea is morbid, I want you to know that, that I believe we need to do some really hard self-evaluation regarding our spiritual lives in terms of where we are and who we belong to. And not only hard self-evaluation, but I thought about this as I walked out of my office this morning in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. It says this, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. But what often happens is that we play a sort of game when we think about our heart, when we think about who we are, where we're going. And we, we, th we play a game. We, we, we think of, we think, I, I'm okay. I really am. I, I, my life is mostly together. I'm a lot better than that person. I'm a lot better than this person. So, so that means I'm okay. We, we think that, that we have time to change. I've, I've got years before I need to change my life. I, I've got years before I have to change what direction I'm going in. Some might even think the words of Scripture are not applicable to them today. Some may think, well, you know, that was God's word back in the Old Testament times. That's, that's when people were really, really bad. But times have changed. I mean, God has got to, he's got to change his word sometime. Let me tell you what, God's word is never going to change. What you see in scripture is going to be there tomorrow the next day, the next year, the next 50 years, until time ends, God's word is going to be the same. Now, for those of you who are reading along with us in the Bible in a year, last Sunday morning was one of those readings that just sort of blew me away. 
Ezekiel 18 is a passage that every one of us needs to read. Ezekiel 18, write it down. What I want you to do is I want you to go home this afternoon. If, even if you've read it before, I want you to read Ezekiel 18 again. I want to encourage you to take some time this afternoon. Because over the years we play the game of who gets into heaven and who doesn't. And chapter 18 of Ezekiel tells us exactly who gets in and who doesn't. But we play games on who gets into heaven and who doesn't. Is there a loophole? Is there a back door? If God is a loving God, as everybody says, then, then everyone gets into heaven, right? But verse 4 of Ezekiel 18 says this, For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Everyone belongs to God. Everyone is his child. They all belong to him. But right there in verse 4 it says, But the one who sins is the one who will die. And the word die means to be separated from God forever in hell. So in reading this passage, we need to stop playing games. We need to start making changes necessary to live forever with Christ. And this morning, I'd like to offer four points in relationship to this change that may need to take place in our lives. And the first one is this. God expects us to change. God expects us to change. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. When we give our lives to Christ, when we ask for forgiveness of sin in our lives, when we become born-again Christians, we are a new creation. Our old way of life must be replaced with a new way of life. A change must take place, and the emphasis on this, all of this is the word must. There has to be a change. We're brand new people, which means our thinking must change, our behavior must change, our commitments must change, and for many, our language must change. The bottom line is that Everything must change that does not align with the kind of life that God desires us to live. Can you remember the time it, that you asked Christ to forgive you of your sins and, and to come live in your heart? Can you, can you remember that time? If you made that decision, do you remember that day? Do you remember where you're at? Maybe it was in an altar that, that there were people praying for you. Maybe it was at your house, maybe it was at home, maybe it was in your bedroom, maybe it was in your car or in a parking lot someplace. But every one of us who have accepted Christ need to remember that time. And when we went to that time, we came to Christ and said, Lord, forgive me of my sins, and we laid them all out. We said, Lord, forgive me of these. But when you got up from the altar, how many did you leave and how many did you pick up and put back in your pocket? You see, the change that God wants us to have is a complete change. It's not just a partial change. It's not just a one-time change for our conversion. But it has to be a continual change. A change that continues every day in our lives to become more like Jesus until God calls us home. When we ask God into our lives and to forgive us of our sins, that is not the end. Although some people think that's the end. They say, I just need to, I, to get him off my back, I'm just going to ask Christ into my life, and, and that's it. That's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of walking a daily relationship that draws us closer to him. In 1 John 2, 6, it says this, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Meaning that if we're claiming to be a Christian, then we better start acting like it. And we better start living like it. John means that our goal is to walk through our home, our workplace, the grocery store, everywhere, talking, acting, and thinking like Jesus. Because Jesus is the perfect example for us. A model of our Christian life after him. 
And God expects us to continually strive to change our lives so that we may be the kind of people that he wants us to be. And God gives us and God expects us to change. That's the first point. The second point is this. We can make a change. Change is possible through Christ. I believe it was Carl who preached on us, nothing is impossible. Is that right, Carl? Is that, is, I, I remember something about what you said. Most, most of the time I was sitting in my lazy boy at home and I was dozing off, but I think I remember you said something about, pardon? Oh, dozing off, yeah. yeah. That happens from time to time. But I, I think I remember you saying nothing is impossible with God. Well, we can say, I can't change. I am who I am. <laughs> no, you're not. Because change is possible through Christ. The change that God is desiring cannot be made outside or without him. We see throughout the New Testament how Jesus changed people. I mean, he changed Paul from a persecutor of the church to a lover of the church. He changed Peter from a fisherman to a fisher of men. He changed Matthew from a, a corrupt tax collector to a respected apostle. He changed Zacchaeus from a thief to a man who gave half of his possessions to the poor. If you truly want to change your life, then change is possible. There is hope for a new beginning and a new way of life. If you know that you need to make some changes, then you can do it with the help of God. When we evaluate what we think, we need to change in our lives. What type of changes do we usually think of? Well, chances are they're external changes. The need to be more like what we feel Christians are supposed to be like. I need to start visiting the sick more. I, I need to study the Bible more consistently. I need to start going to church more often. These changes are good and necessary. They're, they're good and necessary. However, God wants us to do more than just change externally. He wants us to change internally as well. You see, God expects a change. Secondly, we can change. And the third point is this. God wants us to make changes to our heart. Over the years, I've seen a number of people who have professed to accept the Lord, and outwardly, they were able to make some changes in their behavior when they were around other Christians that would give the appearance that they were, in fact, Christians. Outward expressions, though, do not necessarily mean heart changes. It is our heart that God wants. And when the heart changes, it changes our mind, our thoughts, it changes our actions, but it all starts with the change of heart. Because the heart is the foundation of our thoughts, of our passions, of our desires, of our appetites, of our affections, of our purposes, our endeavors. God wants our heart to be right with him and not just our outward appearances and actions. In 1 Samuel 16, God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and anoint one of his sons to be the next king. Samuel did exactly that. He went to Jesse's house and saw one of his sons, Eliab. And this is what we find in 1 Samuel 16, 6 and 7. It says this, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's the heart that matters to God. God doesn't care what you look like. God doesn't care what we wear. God doesn't care if I'm buff or not. God looks at my heart. It's the heart that has to change. In the New Testament, Jesus condemned the Pharisees and religious leaders for outwardly appearing saintly and holy, but inwardly remaining far from God. In Matthew 23, 27, and 28, we find this account. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. It's what's on the inside that matters to God, which then controls the outward. But how do we know if our hearts are not right with God? If you have bitterness, hatred, anger, an unforgiving nature, sexual immorality lingering in your life, envy, jealousy, if you're constantly critical towards others, if you have any type of sin in your life, we could, we could go on and on and on, but your heart needs some changes if those things are evident in your heart. And if your heart needs some changes, then the good news is that you can change your heart condition. Your heart can be renewed and given some spiritual treatment. And point number four. So how can we change our hearts in order to please God? Well, first, we need to ask God for help. Since we're sinful people, we cannot create by ourselves the kind of heart that God wants us to have. And King David recognized this when he wrote in Psalm 51, 10, he said, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We need to go to God in prayer and ask him to change our hearts. In 1 Samuel 10, 9, as Saul was being made the king, we read these words. At, excuse me, I need to go back one. went too far. Can you take me back one, Melissa? As Saul was being made king, we read these words in, in 1 Samuel 10, 9. It says, as Saul turned to leave, Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. Regardless of how far a person's heart is from God, God can change it. I don't care how far you are away from God as you sit in this sanctuary. You can come back to him. And he will make a way for you to come back. I don't care. You can sit there and say, you have no idea how bad of a person I am. You have no idea what kind of sin is in my life. You have no idea what I've gone through in my life. You know what? I feel for you. I empathize with you. But God can change that. You don't have to live that way anymore. I understand this thought is a struggle for some. To believe that anyone's heart can be changed. Because in our world today, we have a lot of evil people. And I understand this idea of God being able to forgive absolutely anyone is disconcerting to some people. But if you would think in your mind, the, the evil, the most evil person that you can think of, they may be in jail, they may be in jail for life, they may be on death row. They may have done unspeakable things in our minds. That person is still not above God changing their life. Any person's heart can be changed if they ask God to change it. Does God have the power to change the hardest of hearts? Yes. Can he change your heart? Yes. But you and I need to ask him for that help. Secondly, we need to make changes to our heart. We need to get rid of sin. Isaiah 59, 2 tells us, But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And the point of that verse is that sin separates us from God. If sin reigns in our hearts and lives, then we are alienating ourselves from God. We have a heart problem when there is, a sin, when there is sin reigning in our lives. So what do we need to do to get rid of our heart, get our hearts back with God? We need to confess our sins to God. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
We can't hide our sins from God. We must acknowledge them before God. When should we confess our sins? Now. You confess them now. You don't hang on to them. You don't say, okay, I'll get around to it someday because none of us are promised someday. We confess our sins now. A proverb writer once wrote this. He said, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I mentioned to you at the start of the message today about Ezekiel 18. Allow me to share with you a few more verses from that passage, and this is what we find. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is right and just, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? This passage teaches us that when we turn away from our sins, then God will forgive us and he will remember our sins no more. And isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that, doesn't that touch your heart this morning? That no matter what sin you may have in your life, God will forgive that. That's the kind of loving God that we have. People are right. God is a loving God, but our heart must belong to him. And if not, then there must be changes made. If we stop the sinning, then our hearts can be brought back to God. God wants us to continue to change our lives. But not only does God want us to change our external characteristics, he wants us to change our hearts because it is a heart that truly matters to him. The way to change our hearts is to ask God for help by going to him in prayer because God is the only one who can truly change our hearts. We must also turn away from sin and confess our sins to him and above all else, we must guard our hearts and not allow sin to enter in. So I ask again, are there any changes that you need to make in your life, any changes that need to be made in your heart before you appear before God on Judgment Day. If somebody would write your eulogy today, if somebody would write about your life today and what kind of person you are, what would it read like? Now this closing illustration is going to date me and, and you if you remember this, but for years, the opening of the program, the Wide World of Sports television program, which first aired in 1961 and finished in 1998, began with different clips of athletes. But one of those clips, one of those spoken words through that, spoke about the agony of defeat. Anyone remember what took place during that when they said the agony of defeat? And the thrill of victory was the other part. But what actually took place when they said the agony of defeat? The skier. There was a ski jumper from Yugoslavia actually fell off the end of the jump platform and ended up in the crowd of spectators. And he's probably most famous for that. Most famous for falling. And that played for years and years and years. And when you heard the words agony of defeat in your mind, that picture automatically came to you. And when you looked at the clip, the skier appeared in good form as he headed down to the jump. But then for no apparent reason, he tumbled head over heels off the side of the jump, bouncing off the supporting structure into the crowd below. And what viewers didn't know was that that jumper actually chose to fall rather than finish the jump. Why? He explained later that the jump surface the, the, was actually too slick. It had become too fast. 
And midway down the ramp, he realized that if I complete this jump, he was going to land on level ground beyond the safe landing area, which would have been fatal. And as it was, the skier suffered more, no more than a headache from the tumble and a lifetime of being associated with the agony of defeat. To change one person's course of life can be a dramatic and sometimes painful undertaking. But change is better than a fatal landing at the end. Changing your life now is better than appearing before God and God saying, depart from me. I never knew you. I would much rather all of us hear the words from God, welcome, good and faithful servant, enter in. But that can only happen if our hearts belong to him and if sin is out of our lives. My question to all of us this morning is, are you still playing games? Because in a message like this, we come to the point where we come to the end and we say, well, you know, yeah, what he says makes sense. I understand that. I understand trying to, to look at our lives and I understand asking God to search us and know us. And I understand all of that. And, and I may have even asked God into my life at one time, but when I got up from the altar or wherever it was that you asked Christ to forgive you, you put a few things in your pocket, and those few things that you put in your pocket are still in your heart. We call them hidden sins. Hidden sins because you don't think anybody's ever going to find out about it. You think nobody's ever going to know, but inside your heart there is something that is still there that is sinful that if you stood before God now would cause us, cause you, not to have a safe landing at the end. And so my question is this. While you may have said, Lord, forgive me, you truly didn't give everything to him. Or maybe you've never given him anything to start with. And as we close this morning, I want you to, I want you to just go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads. And I just want you to ask yourself this question. Is there anything in my heart that would keep me from enjoying heaven eternally with God? Anything. Is there one of those hidden sins? Is there something that's just there? It's been there for years, but it's still there. And I want, you to, I want you to think of something. God wants you to change. God wants that heart to be clean and his and his only. So in just a moment, I'm going to open up the altars. And I'm going to ask if there is anyone here this morning, maybe somebody at home that's watching us, you, you know in your heart that there's something inside of you that shouldn't be there. Maybe you just need to get out of the chair and just kneel in front of the couch or whatever it is and ask God to forgive you and give it over to him and let him keep it. Maybe there's someone here in the sanctuary this morning and you're saying, Pastor, I've, I've given God just about everything in my life. But there's just a couple things that I've hung on to and I need to give them to him this morning. And I'm inviting you, if, if, that is your, if that is your case this morning, I invite you to come to an altar this morning and allow someone to just come beside you and pray with you. Don't allow Satan to say, well, you know, that's, you don't want to do that. Just, just hang on and it'll be over with and you can go home. That's the biggest lie Satan is going to give you because if you walk out of here with it, you're going to keep it. But God says, give it to me. 
Don't walk with it anymore. Make your heart clear. So I want you to continue with having your heads bowed and your eyes closed, but go ahead and stand. And we're just going to take a moment as Elise continues to play. If your heart is not right with God this morning, I invite you to come and make it right this morning. Because God wants to change us, all of us, and he can. So if God is speaking to you this morning, come. Spend a few moments at the altar this morning as we close today. God is doing a work. God is meeting with some at the altar this morning. If you need to meet with God, there's still time, there's still room. Make sure you give him your heart this morning. Lord, as we come to you this morning, as your word has been opened to us, as we realize, Lord, it is our heart that you desire. You, you want all of us, Lord, but it, it, it begins with our heart. And Lord, you have, you have spoken this morning. You have, you have moved within us this morning. I'm trusting that, God, you're moving with those who are watching online this morning. Lord, we, we thank you that, that when you speak to us and, we, and you, you convict us, Lord, that we have some place to go. We know that we can come to you, and it is you, Lord, that are going to make those changes with inside of us. All we have to do is come to you and say, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever is in my heart, Lord, take it. Whatever I've hidden from you, it's yours. Lord, I don't want it anymore. I don't want it controlling any aspect of my life again. Lord, I know that you desire a change. I know that that change can happen because of your power. And Lord, we're seeing your power at work this morning at the altar here as different people have come and they are praying and asking your help, Lord. And Lord, I am just so thankful that when we cry out to you, 
that, Lord, you're there for us. There is nothing, there is nothing that we can do or have done in our lives that cannot be forgiven by you. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I just ask now that you will just meet with those who are here at the altar this morning, that Lord, as they rise from the altar, that you will you will give them a fresh start. That they will rise and they will be lifted because all of those things that might have been inside of them are now yours. And they leave the altar much lighter than when they came. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. For once we were lost, but now we are found. Lord, we thank you. And we ask these things in your precious and holy name. And all of God's children said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Those at the altar, if you want to continue to pray, continue to do that. I started off the service this way. I'm going to finish before baptism this way. God is good. And all the time. God is good. God is good. I see evidence of that in the front row this morning. Many of you have been praying for Ben Hobbiger. Ben was in an accident, motorcycle accident, a number of, well, how long ago has it been, Ben? Six weeks. Six weeks. A week before I had my surgery. I'm still using a cane and Ben is walking around and he was in more pieces than, than a Lego set, and, uh, but God is good, and uh, so we, we give him praise for that. But this morning is also a special day because it's Baptism Sunday, and I am so happy for Baptism Sunday. As Pastor Lane said during our prayer time, Brittany asked you to pray for Brittany Satterfield. Brittany was going to be baptized this morning, and she's in the hospital, and she was so excited about being baptized. She'd had a defibrillator put in. She had got the doctor's okay to, to go ahead and be immersed and be baptized and then she got this infection and now she's back in the hospital so please not only pray for her health but pray for her as I know she really wanted to be here this morning and be baptized but the thing of it is God gives us many opportunities for baptism and I want to give you usually we say this sometime during baptism but because of the message this morning I really feel that there may be someone here this morning who wants to be baptized. Maybe you've been thinking about it for a long time. Maybe there's been all kinds of reasons that it hasn't happened. And you say, well, I, you know, it's just not going to happen because I'm not going to do it this morning. I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. I didn't bring any clothes. I didn't bring a towel. All these other kinds of things. I, let me give you this promise. If you come forward and want to be baptized this morning, I'm going to give you Pastor Lane's towel. And you say, well, yeah, but I, I'll be all wet and everything else. We'll find you something to wear home. It may be an angel costume, but we're going to find you something to wear home. We're not going to just send you home. We, we may even give you a towel to put on your car seat so you don't get your car seat all wet. But I do not want Satan to stop anyone from getting baptized this morning. If God is speaking to your heart right now and say, you need to take this step as well. 
We have a young lady who's going to come in just a moment, and she brought a bus full of people with her this morning. And, and I saw them all filing in, and I thought, man, oh, man. Uh, it, and it's just amazing to me. I, I love it when people invite family and friends to baptism so they can be a part of the enjoyment and seeing the step this young lady is taking this morning. Has already made a commitment to God, but says, I need to go even further. And I love it when I hear people say that. And I'll tell you what, we've, we've got the one, but maybe God has got somebody else. But I'll tell you what, I'd open up this, bapti this baptistry every week and fill it with water it, for, for anybody. I, it, it doesn't have to be a certain times of the year, but we just need to know that God asks us to continually change. We talked about that change. This is one of those changes. You can accept him as Lord and Savior in your life, but there has to be another step. There has to be a progression, and baptism is a part of that. And for Lily, that's the step she's taking this morning. So I'm going to ask Lily and her immediate family, those who are with her this morning, uh, maybe grandparents, if grandparents are here, go ahead and come on up, Lily, and your, your entourage that you have with you this morning. I gave her Mike's mic. I'll give her Mike's mic. Come on over here, Lily. Your family and everybody else come right up here, center. I know you're used to being in front of people, so I'm going to give you the microphone. And say whatever you want to. All right, we are going to, Pastor Lane and Rick are going to be there, so if you'll go over to them. And Lily, is your towel over there by the? Yeah. Okay, we'll make sure somebody gets it for you. And family, if you want to stand closer, you can do that. Now we have uh, here at Sunlight, when someone gets baptized, those who have been a part of Sunlight for many years, what do we say when the person comes up out of the water? Praise the Lord, and I want to hear it loud and strong. I want those of, that are here in uh, honor of Lily this morning, go ahead and stand up right now. I want you to have a bird's eye view either of that or on the screen, so I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Lane. Lily K. Sheets, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Keep breath. Praise the Lord! Praise God! Praise God! to take that step please do not allow the things that Satan may be talking to you about to stop you then I would say we give God one more hand and praise him and say thank you Lord And I'm going to ask Pastor Lane if you will release us this morning and pray for us. Absolutely. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this great time of celebration this morning. God, uh, in, in every aspect of the service, God, we, we thank you for meeting with us. And 
for the encouragement and, and for the challenge. So God, for each one of us, God, may the excitement not dim as we leave this place this morning. God, we pray your blessing, your special blessing over Lily and her family. And God, we pray, God, that you would continue to protect her and strengthen her in her walk with you. God, we pray for every single person that was up here at the altar. God, after the, after the message this morning, God, we pray your hand of protection over them as they take new steps, big steps forward in their walk with you. So God, as you go with us today, God, keep us encouraged, keep us strengthened, and uh, allow our lights to shine ever brighter for you this week, we pray. All these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Have a great day. God bless.